Welcome everybody to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master John Paul Wallace. In our first game today, we're going to have a look at Anatoly Karpov being ground down. And that's that's quite a rare sight. Normally it's uh, Karpov grinding everybody else down with, with a tiny advantage that he just slowly but surely improves and improves and improves until you end up with a position that sort of falls apart. But in this game, played in 1988 between Andrei Sokolov and Anatoly Karpov, Sokolov actually with the white pieces managed to grind Karpov down and you'd almost think if you didn't look at the names that it might have been Karpov playing white. Probably what's even more impressive about this game is that it was in a Kara Khan which just a few um, months before Karpov had been using against Sokolov really successfully but in this game Sokolov manages to sort of get his get his things together so it starts with E4 Sokolov always stuck to that move throughout his career C6 D4 D5 the Karakhan defense Knight D2 this is a little finesse which not all grandmasters adhere to. You, know, you can play knight c3 and then black could consider g6. And um, and now if white ever closes the center with e5, then he might regret his knight being on c3. For example, if you play knight d2, g6, then black white can always support his pawn on d4 with c3 for example knight gf3 bishop g7 this for example bishop e2 knight f6 e5 knight fd7 white has this move c3 if he ever wants to keep a solid center so it's just a little finesse there putting the knight on d2 d takes e4 was played Move four, knight takes e4. And now black has to choose between bishop f5, which Kasparov used to play on the rare occasion that he actually played the Karakhan, or knight d7, which is the Smith's Law variation, which was Karpov's favorite. So, and knight d7 was his, um, the exact move that Karpov had been using against Sokolov really successfully beating him in their candidates matches for the world championship some time before now there's a number of continuations now you could play knight f3 knight f6 knight gf6 knight takes f6 knight takes f6 and now for example knight e5 and now black has an interesting move just knight back to d7 and this can end in a draw if knight f3 knight f6 one way it could end in a draw. Sokolov played what's known to be the main line and he's still the main line. Knight g5. In this way white's keeping some uh, pieces on the board avoiding exchanges for the moment and he wants to play his bishop uh, to either d3 or c4 and it's going to force black to play an early e6 after which his bishop on c8 will be locked in. The first point is if h6 in this position white has knight e6 f takes e6 queen h5 leads to mate. So knight gf6 is the most usual move and now bishop c4 is fully playable as, be as being played by Kasparov immediately forcing e6 Bishop d3 is also a good move. Possibly even a little bit more accurate, I think, because um, it forces black to play e6 anyway, as we'll see. And then the bishop on d3 can, can be good on that diagonal. The first point is if h6, white plays knight e6. Now, f takes e6, bishop g6 is mate again. 
So you, you could play, for example, queen a5 check, bishop d2, queen b6. But now there's a nice move. There's no rush to take uh, that bishop on f8. I think taking on f8, knight takes f8, probably black takes back with the knight. This position might not even be very much advantage for white at all. But a very nice move is uh, knight gf3. Knight f3, and the point is after f takes e6, bishop g6 check, king d8, you just castle. And white sacrificed the entire piece, but the king on d8 is precariously placed, and it's very difficult for black to get his pieces out. So this would be a dangerous attack. And Kasparov actually lost the, the computer, um, Deep Blue, the IBM computer, in a very similar line to that. So, d4, knight d4, knight d7, knight g5, knight gf6, bishop d3. So, Karpov played the main move e6, knight 1 f3. Now, h6 is uh, what allows knight to take c6. Queen e7, castles, f takes e6, bishop g6, check again, a similar piece sacrifice. And Kasparov lost this against the computer. Very strange choice by Kasparov to go into that. There's been a lot of speculation and who knows the truth. He said he accidentally played h6 and he meant to play bishop d6, but that seems a little bit bizarre because Kasparov almost never makes an accident like that. Sure, sure it was a huge match against the computer where he felt like he had nothing to lose, but it seems like a really strange mistake to make. And he's been under huge pressure before playing so many world championship matches. So it's also possible that when he played h6, he simply thought the computer would not sacrifice a piece for a pawn because um, for a computer, such a piece sacrifice like that doesn't appear to make sense because it's long term. So he might have sort of been bluffing the computer a bit. But the mistake in that thinking was the computer has its set opening repertoire. And so he would have been programmed to play it. Even if it, even if the computer thought it wasn't good, it is basically its opening repertoire, and it would have followed it. So, Karpov played on move seven, bishop d6, the correct move. Queen e2, h6. This is all normal. Knight e4, knight takes e4, queen takes e4. And now Karpov played the solid but passive move, knight f6. The move that's become all the rage here is uh, queen c7. Keeping the options open, the knight's better placed on d7 than on f6, but the disadvantage is it allows queen g4, after which castles just loses, the bishop takes h6. So black has more or less forced to play king f8. Strange looking move, but Anatoly Karpov and then other players like John Spielman, English Grandmaster, have had really good results with black in this position. So Karpov, this game against Sokolov was played in 88, but Karpov later turned to this variation with Queen C7 and King F8. But back in 88, Karpov chose Knight F6, which stops Queen G4, has a serious disadvantage which is that the queen just drops down to e2 and now the knight on f6 is somewhat misplaced on d7 it controlled key squares on c5 and e5 so now white can just play for a small advantage nice and steadily and that's exactly what Sokolov did so b6 bishop d2 bishop b7 castles queen side Queen c7, rook hg1, castles queen side. Now it's an interesting moment because um, because you can choose between swapping off bishops now for white with bishop a6 or keeping the bishops on. I think it's a difficult decision for, I mean, uh, Andre Sokolov himself says he wasn't sure. Um, I'll read out Sokolov's comments here because it's quite interesting. He said, In my game against Spraggett, 
this is another grandmaster from Canada I did not exchange bishops and got an excellent position but in general exchanging the bishops will yield quite a small but lasting advantage now I think that's that's a good comment because um, basically by swapping off your bishop on d3 for black's bishop on b, b7 you are to a certain extent losing some of your what could be a powerful bishop but on the other hand if you look at black's position sooner or later he's going to play c5 after which his bishop on b7 is going to be an asset it's going to be quite powerful on the other hand if you go and swap it off with bishop a6 then black's left with not black's left with the sort of undynamic position it's quite passive and, and it also means that the bishop on b7 when it goes black's king on c8 will be ever so slightly weakened just losing one of its defenders Sokolov's assessment that it, um, it basically takes some of the sting out of black's position which means that white gets a small very small edge but a lasting one is a good comment and it's interesting that he chose that against Karpov because most players playing Karpov they're so used to seeing him grind other people out that they don't actually think that they could grind him out and so normally for example they keep the bishops on and try and beat him in complications I think it shows a very mature and brave decision by Sokolov to try and grind Karpov out because uh, just because Karpov likes to grind other people doesn't mean that he likes to defend so th those sort of positions when he's on the other side of it it's a huge mistake that people make when they see that a player seems to have a solid style so when they could get a solid but small edge against them they avoid it and in instead think yeah but my opponent's so solid it's Karpov I have to smash him I have to go for something more complex <clears throat> that can be a fundamental error because when Karpov is normally doing the grinding he's doing it from a position of strength on the other hand if now you have Karpov in a position of weakness where he's, he's, on, the, he's on the wrong side of a grind type position he can really feel like a fish out of water and he might actually prefer that you just went for him in a huge attack then he can sort of battle that off and have a good position so why is play by Sokolov bishop a6 bishop takes a6 queen takes a6 king b8 now again a mature, dis a mature move queen just goes back to e2 the queen was not doing anything on a6 anymore and um, there was no chance of any sort of mate knight d5 c4 that's a good move and quite standard in the Karakhan white pawn puts his pawns on c4 and d4 and aims to get an advantage in space knight f4 and now a Karpov like move from Sokolov it would, be ex it would be a shame to exchange bishop for knight so he simply retreats queen f1 holding the pawn on g2 and knowing that whenever he feels like it he can just play g3 and kick Karpov's knight away so Karpov retreated immediately knight g6 g3 and we can already conclude that Karp Sokolov has got what he wanted which is just a small but sort of steady advantage because he's got an extra pawn in the center sooner or later that knight on f3 is going to jump into e5 bishop e7 Karpov wants to put his bishop on f6 and gang up maybe double on, on the d-file gang up on white's d-pawn h4 is a good move now black has to worry about h5 booting his knight back so he had to play h5 himself but it does mean that sooner or later g5 is now accessible for white's pieces queen e2 just bringing the queen back into the game slow and steady rook d7 and now already bishop g5 a slight achievement white doesn't normally get to use the g5 square in the karakam because black's pawns on h6 so this is sort of handy bishop f6 rook d2 rook hd8 rook e d1 I'm going to read 
uh, Sokolov's comment again. All forces are mobilised for both sides and White's position must be deemed preferable because he has the possibility of strengthening his position. What a great comment. And that's the sort of thing that Karpov tends to do to his opponents. He'll get a position that seems fairly innocuous but he'll just have that chance of slowly grinding away at you. Queen b7. King b1. I was waiting for that move, King b1. Just means the king's slightly safer. King a8. Karpov follows suit. And a3, again, excellent. Just, just small improvements in white's position. The king can now run to a2 if need be. Queen a6. Bishop takes f6, g takes f6, knight e1, this is a great retreat, again a Karpov like retreat, suddenly queen takes h5, he's introduced into the position, and furthermore the knight's going to go from e1 to c2, protecting the d-pawn with the possibility of jumping up to b4. Knight e7. So now queen takes h5 is too early because of knight f5. Hitting the d pawn and also queen takes c4. Next. So Sokolov just continues on his merry way with knight c2. Landing knight b4. b5. Knight b4. Queen b7. And now comes a great move, d5, a breakthrough move. An important situation as well because any other move, for example, c5 would allow knight d5. Perhaps not immediately though because the queen takes pawn. You'd have to defend your h pawn first, but it basically moves like c c5 gives black to d5 square, that's the point. Whereas C takes B5 is the same problem. Gives black the D5 square. In fact, Sokolov might even take with a queen. Offering a swap off. It's basically equalized. D5 changes things. The pawn structure is completely different now. And black has a couple of choices. If ED5, CD5, Knight D5. Knight takes d5. It could be a massive swap off here, but white ends up taking the pawn on h5 with an advantage. White's king is somewhat better, his pawn structure is better, and that h pawn is ready to fly up the board to h8 and try and get a new queen. So the end game suits white, even the queen end game. C takes d5 appears to be better. But now Sokolov switches and takes on b5 instead. Interesting and completely changing, um, the, ch changing the, the structure of the game. Because now black actually has an advantage in the center. But funnily enough, white has an advantage on both wings. He's better on the queen side. The, the knight on b4 and pawn on b5 are quite nice little structure. Possibility if the knight on e7 ever moves, the knight comes straight into c6. And of course, the pawn on h5 is a real liability for black. And Karpov really should have defended that pawn at the moment with a move like rook h8, even though it's a bit, it's a bit upsetting to have to tie down a rook to the defense of just one pawn. But uh, the Karpov wanted to get active here and played rook c8, sacrificing the pawn, but an incorrect decision. And again, this is what I'm talking about. Um, how it's such a mistake to not put Karpov in these situations where you grind him out. Because who wants to play a move like Rook H8? Even Anatoly Karpov couldn't bring himself to do it. So um, so don't don't think that just because a player is a grinder that they're, they're good on the defensive side of that. Karpov, in a sense, lashing out with Rook C8 in a, in a very limited sense of the word. In this, he just couldn't be bothered defending his H-pawn didn't want to go passive.
queen takes h5. Sokolov's quite happy just to take it. Knight g6. If queen takes b5 instead, then whitehead queen takes f7. Queen e2, covering the pawn. Knight e5. And now a very good move. Perhaps Karpov underestimated this when he played rook c8. White just plays b3, keeping the knight out of c4. After which Karpov's counterplay is really limited. <coughs> rook d c7, rook c2, of course the exchanges are in white's favour. Rook c2, knight c2, a6, knight d4, good move. A takes b5, knight takes b5. Still not an easy position for Sokolov here. His king is a little bit weak. Of course, Karpov's king is weak as well. Still, and he's only one pawn up. It is an important pawn, though, that, that outside past h pawn. There's still a lot of work to do to win this. Queen b6. A4, maintaining that knight on b5. Queen c5. Queen d2. Introducing queen a5, check into the position. Knight f3. Now Sokolov takes a nice little opportunity to exchange pieces. Queen c1. Queen takes c1. Rook takes c1. And now Sokolov was offering Karpov to win a pawn back here, but it would have been disastrous for Karpov. He was offering knight d2 check, king b2, rook c1, king c1, knight takes b3 check, king c2, knight c5, but after h5, white's easily winning this past h pawn, just too powerful. Also, if black goes on the defensive, white also has knight d6 and just knocking off the pawn on f7. So, Karpov couldn't go for that. So he played rook d8. Getting ready to push his d-pawn. And now, um, Sokolov really impresses me with his next move because it, it really shows fine calculation. At some point in the chess game, you can't just sit on your opponent. You have to calculate variations and, and go into something forcing. Um, Black's ready to get some counterplay by playing d4, d3, d2. But Sokolov does some calculation and figures out that he can stop that in time, while in the meantime basically destroying Karpov's position. So he starts with rook c7. Karpov's forced, is committed to go for d4. Rook takes f7, d3, king c1, this is the point, d2, king d1. And Sokolov's calculated that, that um, Karpov's not going to be able to break through with this d-pawn. For example, if rook c8 here, rook c7 would be good enough. Stopping rook c1, check. Karpov went for rook d3. So obviously he wants to take on b3 and play rook b1, check. But there's knight c7, check. King b8, knight a6, check. King a8. He just repeated moves, knight c7, check. King b8. Knight takes e6, rook takes b3. And now rook f8 check. His rook is going to go to d8, stopping Karpov's d-pawn from promoting. King a7, rook d8, rook b1 check, king e2. Karpov's uh, d-pawn can't promote. He can win the exchange, rook for knight, but obviously uh, Sokolov's just going to have too many pawns. But there was nothing else to do, so Karpov had to go for it. Rook e1, check. King takes f3. 
D1 Queen Rook takes D1 Rook takes D1 King F4 Clearly the Rook's no match The pawn on F6 is dropping off And um It's not going to be a chance Let's have a look what happened anyway Karpov played it out Rook F1 F3 King B6 Knight G7 He just wants to play his Knight to H5 and win Karpov's last pawn King C6 Knight H5 King D6 Knight takes F6 Karpov could have resigned at this point King E7 Knight H5 King F7 G4 King G6 Knight G3 Rook A1 H5 check King F7 G5 Really nothing Karpov can do to stop this avalanche Rook takes A4 check King F5 Rook A5 check King G4 Rook A4 check F4 of course Rook B4 Knight F5 Rook B1 H6 Rook G1 check King H5 Rook F1 Knight D6 check King E6 And now a nice move just King G6 Cup off through in the towel at this point the pawns are just too strong. If king takes knight on d6 and h7, rook h1, king g7, followed by h8 equals queen. With a winning pawn end game to finish. So, very impressive game by um, Andrei Sokolov. He beat Karpov at his own game. Got a slight advantage from the opening. Karpov's knight f6 on move 10, slightly passive. Then on move 15, bishop a6 was the, basically the signal that he intended to grind it out. And after that, I think Karpov wasn't even clear what he did wrong. Um, h4 was a good move by Sokolov on move 21. And then basically he just got a nice edge. And probably the most serious mistake was Karpov playing rook c8 on move 33, just giving up his h pawn. Probably should have just gone passive with rook h8 and just tried to hang in there, but but uh, not easy to do when when you're under positional pressure. You tend to want to keep as active as possible. It's an excellent game. All right, thank you everybody, and I look forward to presenting my next lecture to you, which is bashing the Benko Gambit. Thank you.